Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Bush. I head up the user experience design team at Sigma. And what we do is we do a lot of digital projects uh, and, and non-digital projects that effectively have a lot of deep user research in them. And what we try and do is to understand users' needs and goals and translate them into artifacts and products and services. Um, I'm Elizabeth Bowie. I'm a senior user experience consultant at Sigma, and I've recently finished a PhD in design research at Northumbria University. So part of what we're going to talk about today comes from my PhD research. So what we're going to start off by doing is looking at the, the rise of human factors design and how that's translated into how we engage with technology today, talk about some of the um, bad things that happen when we interact with technology, sometimes from the organizational side, and how those, that knowledge and that experience can be applied to positive things. So to set the scene, how many times have we found ourselves playing on Facebook or YouTube or a digital service and sort of like going in for, with the intention of spending a minute or two and find ourselves spending 15 or 20 minutes? Okay, how many times have we experienced something that evoked in us awe and wonder and a feeling of mystery? And, um, and so we want to keep doing that. It's not the, the addictive kinds of things that Facebook and, and Twitter and perhaps Instagram may evoke, but it's a, a feeling of being part of something grander. So first I want to talk about what is user experience. When people say user experience, they mean one of three things. The phenomenon, the experiences that people have when they're using these products or when they're seeing advertisements for them even or when they're watching other people use it. So it's not all direct use. Some of it is indirect use. User experience is also a field of study. This is an academic field. And they study what experiences are and how we can foster experiences that we want people to have. Um, and it's also a practice. And, um, and that is about designing to foster specific user experiences. Now, people sometimes talk about designing an experience, and I just want to make it clear that that's not possible. Because you're, you can only design what is experienced. You can design for experience, but the experience, and experience is always individual. You probably know this. And it's as much a part, it's, it's the, the contribution from what the user brings to it is as strong as the stuff that is designed and is experienced. Human-computer interaction is what we term the academic field. HCI research came in three waves, from cognitive science initially in the early 80s, through the mid-80s to groups working with collections of applications. These are in the workplace. These are, um, it's called Computer Supported Cooperative Work, and that's still going on. There's a conference in that. And then it broadened into um, the home and games and even the church. Um, in terms of user-centered design practice, similar three waves. They aren't identical in the waves. Um, this came from Bentley University, which is in Boston or Cambridge, somewhere in the Boston area, Massachusetts. Um, about, uh, and they were focused on documentation. When I was working in the, in the first wave, I was working at NASA, and we were as much about the system as we were about the documentation and training. So it just depends on the context of the person who's looking at it. But still, the first wave was about how the, the artifact helped people do what they needed to do. Usable and useful was the second wave, and this was the birth of usability. Usability is also more or less external. It's about the um, effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction that um, people can perform their tasks in a given environment to, to do um, given, in a given context of use. And satisfaction includes some aspects of user experience, but not all of it. And then there's user experience, which we deepen our understanding of what people experience inside when they use these things. 
So what I wanted to do is talk about um, how, uh, when we talk about software and applications, we tend to think about user friendliness and usability. Um, but there's um, other things that have come into play in our everyday lives when we interact with technology. And I wanted to talk about those things. So as the web uh, became, became more popular and there were more sites on the web, one of the ways that organizations invested in trying to get more users to their website is they invested in things like search engine optimization. If they can put more people on their website, they would hopefully sell more of their services and more of their products. The problem is, is it doesn't matter how much you invest in making your uh, site or service findable, if users can't use your site or service, um, they're not going to be able to purchase. So the next thing that came is around making services more efficient. How do you get you a user to their designated goal with the least amount of friction? As the web became even more um, rich in terms of the sites out there, or the app stores with more apps on there, it then became about how do we persuade someone that they, they want to use our service and they want to engage. So if someone can leave your site and go to an alternative site in the space of a few seconds, <coughs> Capturing that person's engagement is really important to whether a service is deemed a success or not. So, usability. If you were to be this store in a high street, that door is highly usable. Multiple people could get through it. Uh, people in wheelchairs can get into it. It's, and it's, it's designed to be inviting, so it takes you in. The problem is, is, if you take that store and then put it in a mall, and you've got hundreds of stores, store then has to put lots of effort into capturing your attention to encourage you to go. So things that they do is they, they put promotions on the windows. They, they let you know. They put the product they think you're most likely to buy in front of the store to try and pull you in. Then when you go in, as we were just talking about, you, you get a path that kind of guides you around and tries to lead you to things that they think you, you might be interested in purchasing. When it comes to digital, these sorts of things appear uh, very, very frequently as well. And quite often they're subtle. So there's a famous department store in the UK called John Lewis. And primarily they have an older demographic. So when they were looking to get their online store to be competitive and to address their users' needs, there was lots of perceptions from the user's point of view about not wanting to put their credit card details into a digital purchasing channel. It, it, it felt insecure. So they used lots of phrases on their buttons their, their user journey, as we were talking about earlier, that talk about security and being safe. They show lots of credit cards don't they, which work as an endorsement, making you think if these companies are vindal, this site is more likely to be safe and secure, even though any site would great to have those on there. So it's about perception. Amazon, where uh, in the late 90s, when they were looking to uh, help users through their um, uh, shopping cart journey, one of the things that they focused on is how do we remove uh, the burden from the process. So one of the burdens on online stores is you're having to fill in all your details every time you buy something. So by introducing something like the, the one-click shopping, you've then removed a significant chunk of that journey. So if you're one of their customers, you can get through the shopping cart journey uh, faster. So it becomes slightly less about usability more about persuading the user that this is a good way to buy something. This gets richer in, in some cases where organizations start using multiple techniques at the same time to try and set your perceptions that something is a good, start, a good value to you. So this is Basecamp. Has anyone used Basecamp? Yeah. So this is their old purchasing screen, but it's a brilliant example of persuasion design. And they did this before persuasion design was kind of popular in the mainstream. Uh, they were kind of ahead of the curve a bit. So when you first go to their purchasing page, it shows you the price. And it starts off with the highest one, so $150. Okay, that's a bit too much. Maybe I don't want that. Oh, this one's only 99 And you step down again to the 49 one. And what they've done is they've put extra emphasis on this, and saying it's the most popular. If those numbers were around the other way, and it said $24 a month, $50 uh, to $50 a month, the perception is the price has doubled. So by having it this way, 
which one's more likely to catch your attention? You're more likely to focus on it. So, all of this is about persuasion. There, there's nothing particularly uh, bad going on here. This is the sort of sales techniques that we see on in most stores and most experiences we have when we're in a commerce environment. But some people use uh, these patterns and these ideas uh, with a more negative intent to basically deceive users and manipulate. So um, in 2010, Harry Brignall defined a dark pattern as an interface feature carefully crafted to trick users into doing things they might not do otherwise. So you might not be surprised to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ryanair were one of the first organisations to make <laughs> to be uh, captured in the media for uh, de deliberately misleading users. So when a user's filling in their passenger details, that's what that box says at the top, there's a form and you enter your first name, your middle name and the number of bags you've got. Then there is a box underneath with a yes or a no. And then there's a statement here that says, please select country of residence. And you pick your country of residence. What you've potentially done then is you've bought a travel insurance. Because they haven't separated travel insurance from the passenger details. But that's okay because you might work that out and you might decide, do I don't want it? Ryanair, in their wisdom, decided that I don't want travel insurance exists between Latvia and Lithuania in their drop down. <laughs> A very clear example of mis-selling insurance. In a later version, they fixed it and they separated insurance from passenger details. They still hit, I don't want travel insurance, but this time it won't be from Czech and Denmark. <laughs> so, uh, Comet, a now defunct retailer in uh, the UK, decided that if you wanted to buy an iPad, perhaps if you were buying an iPad, you might want to buy an iPad case as well. So when you check to add to basket, they added a £30 iPad case to your bag. Uh, they basically said, at Comet, we want you to be able to enjoy your purchase. So we added this product to your basket so you can get going straight away. Now, if you imagine that situation in a store where you're walking around a, a Tesco's or a Sainsbury's or something like that, can you imagine what would happen if a, um, the manager was walking around putting stuff in your basket and you were walking around? <laughs> You'd be infuriated. So, these are quite old examples, but effectively deception where the user has to take action not to do something. So in the early example, the user took action to do something. Here, they have to opt out, and normally it's at their expense. Amazon, uh, as recently as about 18 months ago, um, added this screen to their checkout site. Why pay for shipping? So six, $6.60 with free two-day shipping. Uh, two-day shipping. That sounds like a bargain, doesn't it? But if you read this bit of text here, to get the free two-day shipping, your Amazon Prime membership continues until cancelled. So they basically opt you in to an $80 a year service. And not, none of that is clear from that perception. So, as you can rightly guess, uh, in the UK, the trading laws were changed to basically stop organisations doing this. Uh, Amazon, Spotify, Netflix were all guilty <coughs> of using this practice. So effectively, tricking the users into buying something and they're not understanding what it meant. So, all of those interactions focus on the user interacting with the service at the point of interaction. So when they're on the site, they're modeling, uh, encouraging the user to do something. Facebook actually tries to design your behavior before to the site. So this has come up a couple of times today. And there's a model that's been described by uh, uh, a guy from Stanford called Nir Inav. And he has broken the process down into four steps. So a trigger, an action, a reward, and an investment. And the important bit is there's two parts to the trigger. So there's an external motivation and an internal motivation which causes the user to take action and then they're rewarded for that action. So Facebook, you get a notification telling you someone's put a photo. Your internal motivation is, oh, I wonder what picture they've posted. So you click it. When you go into the site, you're rewarded with content, potentially with content that others, other people you know have 
contributed to the system. Your investment into the process is when you add a comment, the cycle starts again, because when you add a comment, the hook is effectively, they can send you another notification saying, thing is like your post, see how many likes you've got, and your reward is seeing how great your friends think you are. <laughs> so by designing this process, Facebook and lots of other social media services are constantly trying to bait you into getting into it. That external trigger doesn't necessarily always have to be an active one. It could just be bored. I'm bored, I'm going to check Facebook. And then you lose me. <laughs> so that's a negative description of it. Now, that understanding, it's very easy to find ways of pulling out the negative much harder to find the ways that can be used positively, uh, but there are some brilliant ones. So has anyone heard of an app called Flowy? It's uh, an app, it was developed by a company in London called Playlab, and it's designed to help people who have panic attacks and high anxiety. So the idea is, is it uses exactly the same model. When you have a panic attack, that becomes your external trigger. Your internal trigger is, I want to relax, I want to calm down. You load up the app, some very simple breathing games that allow you to regain calm. And the games, because you're going to be stressed and worried and uh, not really going to be concentrating on playing the games, focused on low interaction, low reward. But you get a reward as you relax. So the game becomes simple and effectively it brings you back calm. And then the investment is if it works, when it happens again, you go back. And if you look at some of the reviews, Sometimes I feel like it's a secret weapon. So by understanding the behaviours and the way that people interact with technology, you can get as many good interactions and experiences as you can around negative. Cool. The, in 2017, Apple named Calm its app of the year. And it is a technology that helps people uh, remain calm or produce calm or realize calm or whatever. Um, and it's kind of related to the Flowey app, but it's not for necessarily anxiety. It's just calm in general. And it's really interesting and, and encouraging that, that these sorts of things are gaining uh, prominence in the field. Positive computing is part of this third wave. It's a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, it's also called um, positive technology and positive design, but they're essentially the same thing. And it's a focus of research and practice. And there, it's aimed at supporting well-being in many ways. Now, what's interesting is that many of these technologies address the conscious mind. For example, health measurements and metrics. Um, they uh, they do. They track your activity, or I I have a um, a pedometer in my phone, so so I'm always trying to get so a certain number of steps every day. Um, there are intelligent weight trackers, um, which will put your weight on the internet if you want. I can't imagine why anybody would want to do that. But, um, or there are calorie counters. It's all about information. It's all about um, keeping you current with what's going on in your health. But this may not be the most effective way of achieving permanent change, long-lasting change. Andrea Gadjuli, who um, wrote a book called, or a chapter of a book called Transform Transformative Experience Design, um, and he's done a lot of work in this field. He says, it's not always the result of a gradual and linear process under conscious control. Sudden transformations, enduring transformations, can be the result of epiphanies and sudden insights. And so transformative experience design or transcendent experience design can be, the, and I don't claim that they're the same thing, um, can be a very powerful way of achieving positive change. So um, I did my PhD research on designing for transcendent experience. And so I had to study Transcendent experience, I had to study techno-spirituality, the use of technology and spirituality and religion. I studied various design uh, tools, methods, 
such as design games, design fiction. And um, so common adjectives for self-transcendence, for a transcendent experience. And I want to stress that a transcendent experience is an experience of connection with something greater than yourself, and it may or may not be religious. Life-changing effects. People have epiphanies. They convert to a different religion. They have a, great, a personality change and feel more connected to humankind. Um, trans, uh, transcendent experience has been used in uh, smoking cessation programs. This is something that Johns Hopkins University is doing. Um, and the Garcia Romeo um, and his colleagues at Johns Hopkins found that, that transformations in worldview and so on are a, are, can be an outcome of a transcendent experience. So now, as I said, it doesn't have to be religious. Greater than oneself can mean a lot of different things. It could be religious or it could be um, uh, community, it could be the universe, it could be nature. There are various names for transcendent experience. Some people consider flow a transcendent experience. Levin and Steele considered it a very low level transcendent experience. Trans flow is generally about an activity, however, and transcendent experience usually is not. So only at the extremes of flow do we have transcendence. Techno-spirituality is, as I said, the study of technology and spirituality and religion. And again, spirituality is, is another way of looking at transcendence. It's, uh, it's a spiritual connection with something greater, and it may or may not be religious. One of my first projects in my PhD research was to study the, uh, do an inventory of the iTunes app store for general keywords on spirituality and religion, and then compare that with the HCI research that was available on those subjects. And at that time, I found that this was in December of 2012, January of 2013, I found that there were 6,000 apps on the App Store. I did another search last night, and I found 120,000. So in five and a half years, an increase of 20 times. I don't know how that keeps pace with the overall explosion in iTunes apps, but you know it's still substantial. And not all of those, of course, are supporting transcendent experience. Probably only a small number of them are. A lot of them are about learning and, and um, prayer exchanges. But you never know what somebody might have a transcendent experience while they're using. So these have a wide variety of uses and purposes. I conducted interviews with 24 people from a variety of spiritual perspectives. I used constructivist grounded theory methods to develop a grounded theory of transcendent user experience. This is the, my grounded theory diagram. I discovered that a transcendent experience is a cycle of phases. And what, what I uh, documented that I haven't seen in any other research is the cyclical nature of it, that when you integrate the experience, I mean, other research has said there are long-term effects, yes, okay, but you're integrating that in your life, and that may result in changes that you make that produce or um, trigger or facilitate further transcendent experiences, and that's why it's cyclical. You may have an experience while you're meditating, and you decide to meditate more often, for example. And then, um, I added uh, two themes of uh, using artifacts in these experiences. I mean, one could say that artifacts could be part of the context, but I was focused on artifacts, so I brought that out. And, um, and desiring enhancement for both the experiences and for the artifact support for them. I'm not going to go into detail about all of those here. The important thing for design is the desires for enhancement. And so here's what I found that people wanted as enhancements or technology support for enhancements to their transcendent experiences. Now, how do we approach design for transcendent user experience? Transcendent experiences are ineffable. They're beyond words. Normally, when we design a technology for user experience, for a website, for example, or, or any sort of most digital services that we provide, 
we kind of have a good idea of the kind of experience that we want people to have when they're using it, but for transcendent experience, they're ineffable, they're beyond description. So how do we, I mean, you can describe parts of this, but many, many times people will say, I have no words for what I experienced. I have no words for what I felt, for what I saw, for what, I, what was there, for what it was about. And so we need to find another way of addressing them. Um, we cannot, call, normally when we do design, we do usability testing. We sit people down in front of a, a prototype and we have them use it. And we find out what kinds of experiences they have when they use it. Well, again, you cannot do that with a transcendent experience because you can't be sure when you sit people down in front of something that they're going to have a transcendent experience. One of my interview peop, uh, participants said, um, you can't dial it up. You can kind of put yourself in the way of it, but you can't dial it up. So I developed a framework that I call peripheral design, and the idea is that you're getting at design sideways. So, and that consists of a design game to elicit ideas in an atmosphere of fun and play. It's not a competitive game, because designing for transcendence, competitiveness kind of gets in the way of that feeling. Um, use design fiction to draw on a suspension of disbelief to envision the ideas as they might be in use and how people might re respond to them. And that is a su suspension of disbelief in two ways. As Bruce Sterling said, um, he has popularized and done a lot of work on design fiction. As he said, design fiction is the use of diegetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about change. So one of the suspensions of disbelief is about change. The other is suspension of disbelief about the beliefs of people who are having these experiences and you can design for them if you can sp suspend your own disbelief about it. For example, um, several of my interview participants were religious. I'm an agnostic, so I don't have any particular views on what they believe, but I am, I'm interested in what goes on in people's heads. And so anytime they told me, you know, they had an experience of God or they had an experience of their deceased mother or something, I said, that's interesting, tell me more. So suspending, using design fiction to suspend disbelief about the uh, religious beliefs of the people you're designing for or other sorts of beliefs is another useful attribute of design fiction. And then there's design poetry. Um, Robbins, in, um, in a paper on uh, performance poetry, talked about how the ineffable is connected with the unconscious and poetry can convey that in the spaces between the words. I thought that was a particularly powerful way of looking at it. And, and so um, writing poetry to create a sort of, uh, to convey something of what that experience might be like is different from our usual mundane, even playful designs because it, it comes from a different part of our conscious or our unconscious. So here's an example of an idea that came from a design game that I ran. It's, I call it Showerfall. It, this is not my idea. This was one of the participants. She didn't give it a name. And the projector displays on the bath images of water flowing through over rocks to give the idea that you're in nature while you're showering. I use, we can use design fiction to suspend disbelief about what, um, what somebody might experience or how this might play in their lives and we can imagine the user experience. We can draw on imaginary abstracts which are an imaginary abstract is an abstract of a paper that has not been written about a prototype that does not exist. And, and that is a quote from Blythe. Blythe. Mark Blythe was my PhD supervisor. And, um, and we can imagine HCI research on these, on these ideas. I created new forms of imaginary abstract to envision different forms of research. For example, I put Showerfall in a chemotherapy clinic and imagined how people might respond to that. I mean, I didn't, not in, in 
practice, but I envisioned it that way. And then there's design poetry. And here's my haiku about Showerfall. So designing for the unconscious has a potential for good. And I, one thing we did not mention that's in the paper is that, that usability is all about drawing on unconscious behaviors for smoothing, streamlining the interaction. By, uh, there's a, a popular book called Don't Make Me Think about how to do usability testing. So it can remove friction from experiences of digital technologies, and it can help people realize change. On the other hand, as we saw, dark patterns are bad. I think we can, at least in this room, we can probably all agree on that. And we're, we're aware of four ways that they might be addressed. We can foster po positive experiences. We need positive models and patterns to help us design for them. And, um, and, any, and God Julie has um, has proposed four categories of possible patterns. He hasn't, as far as I know, he hasn't actually suggested specific patterns, but, um, but it's got some potential. And, um, and he's also suggested virtual reality as a way in which uh, transformative experiences might be supported. So a question that, that we think needs an answer is, when should apps aim to be immersive in other words, to evoke the experience, and when, it should, when should it be supportive of the experience that the person has had. So fostering positive experience, we want to design to evoke transcendent experiences as appropriate, assist people in integrating them into their lives. And um, Chris, do you want to talk about this last bit? Yeah, and can we use And, and we propose that uh, the idea of light patterns as opposed to dark patterns, and um, this was Chris's brainstorm yesterday, last night, as we were trying to put the finishing touches on this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was amazed that it wasn't already registered. So we have this, and we're hoping to build on that. Thank you.